All right. So let's get started here. Uh, we're going to start it on chapter 14, which is titled Conjugated Dyings. Okay. We'll talk more towards the end of our lecture about what this conjugated term means. But what about this term dying? What do we think that means? Double bond, but not just one, but two. And really, we'll talk about multiple double bonds. But the point being is we're going to talk about alkenes with more than one double bond. Okay. Um, before we sort of dive in here, let's go over our nomenclature for dienes. All right, we spent a lot of time last week. We're going to go pretty quick here, but just to do some examples so we can see. Okay. So how do we indicate when we have more than one double bond, as in this compound here? Well, we do our same steps as we always do. We're going to find our parent chain. Remember, our parent chain has to include our functional groups, our double bonds. Um, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. It's going to be these four carbons here in our parent chain. Okay. If there was just one double bond, it would be butene. We've got to indicate the position of that double bond, but now we have two. So if we're going to number our carbons, one, two, three, four, remember we refer to our double bonds by the lower number. This would be one, three, butadiene. Okay. Um, one thing to note here, so first of all, obviously there's the dye. Why is there the dye in the name? Because we got two double bonds. Um, but importantly, it's not butadiene, it's butadiene. And this is this anomaly in organic chemistry nomenclature. We never run two consonants together. All right, because diene starts with a D, a consonant, and but would end in the T, the consonant, we're going to retain that A so that we don't run these two consonants together. All right, it would just be butene, but now it's butadiene. about consonants. Is that correct? Whatever. Non-vowels, whatever we want to say. Okay. Cool. Um, for this one, that's, that's done. I'm done with the name, right? I don't have any E or Z stereochemistry to worry about. How can I tell by looking at this molecule that there is no stereochemistry in either one of these double bonds? What's the giveaway here? So, the key thing here is whenever you have two groups that are identical on one side of your double bond, you can't assign high and low priority. So if we look at my double bond over here, there's a hydrogen pointed this way and a hydrogen pointed that way. How would I possibly assign one high or low priority? So when you have two identical groups, this is a double bond that doesn't have E and Z stereochemistry. All right. So then let's look at a more complicated one. Keep our example here. All 
All right, first let's take a second, let's try to name this thing without worrying about our E and Z stereochemistry, and then we'll go through and assign stereochemistry to this molecule as well. So our parent chain, remember we're going to find the longest continuous set of carbons, but there's a very important caveat when there's a functional group in our molecule, which is that parent chain must contain that functional group. So before I even find my longest continuous set of carbons, I know these four right here containing those functional groups must be a part of my parent chain. All right, so my longest continuous set of carbons would be these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. I'm going to number my parent chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Go the other way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Which one of these numbering schemes is correct, the red or the blue? The red, and remember, for these double bonds, for these functional group containing compounds, the only thing I'm going to pay attention to is the location of that double bond, right? So I want to make sure that double bond has the lowest possible number. Okay, and then sticking off of my parent chain, I still have these two carbons unaccounted for, and this is of course an ethyl group. So when I put my name together here, ignoring my stereochemistry for right now, this would be 3-ethyl. I need the location of both of those double bonds, so 2-4-hept. And then not heptdiene, but again, we're going to keep that A, heptadiene. Okay? All right, so now we got to worry about stereochemistry. I'm going to get rid of some of my markings here so we don't get too confused. Since this was my first double bond in my molecule, right? This one was the one at carbon two. We're gonna assign this one first. We have to chop down the middle. We're gonna look on, we're gonna do the right side first because it's gonna be a little bit easier. We need to assign high and low priority. What's the low priority group over here on the right hand side? This implied hydrogen right here. Right, hydrogen, lowest atomic number, that will always be your low priority group. So that means this carbon of this methyl is my high priority group. If I jump to my other side, I have a tie. These are both carbons. How do we break our tie? We gotta list everything that's bound to that carbon. All right, so for this one here, my list will contain the carbon right here, this guy, right? So carbon, and what else do I need on that list? Those two implied hydrogens. Cool. Okay. If we look at the top one here, 
Now it is not single bonded, but double bonded to this carbon over here. So that means I'm gonna add two carbons to my list, right? For a double bond, you count that element twice. And then what's my third bond consist of? Again, that implied hydrogen. All right, so carbon, carbon, hydrogen versus carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, which list wins? The one with two carbons, right? Highest atomic number. Cool. So all that to say, this is my high priority group. And this is my low priority group, that ethyl group. So since the two high priority groups are on Zizame side, that means that this has the stereochemistry Z. All right, so I'm gonna clear this up, make room for the next one, and we're just gonna make a note, oops. This one is the Z stereochemistry. Oops, I got rid of too much. All right, this one's a little bit more straightforward here. Chop at my double bond. If I look on the left, again, what's my low priority group? That implied hydrogen. If I look on the right, what's my low priority group? That implied hydrogen. So then what is the stereochemistry for this particular bond? My high priority groups are on opposite sides, right? If they're on Z same side, it's Z. If they're on opposite sides, it's going to be the E stereochemistry. Cool, so now how the heck do I build this into my name here, right? I got two double bonds. I have to indicate which one's E, which one's Z. Let's remember, let's put in our numbering here. Okay, but what we're gonna do is, again, in parentheses, we're gonna put in our stereochemistry, and we have to indicate the position and the stereochemistry of each bond. So it's 2Z and then 4E. Right, just indicating the stereochemistry of both of those double bonds in my name. So 2Z, 4E, 3-ethyl, 2,4-heptadiene. Just rolls off the top. All right, cool. So when we have multiple, you can actually always build in the locant with your stereochemistry. You could always say 2Z or 4E, but if you have more than one double bond, you have to do it. Right? You have to build it into the name to indicate which one you're talking about. Cool. And again, with regard to our dienes, we're going to refer to them with that suffix diene. And because diene starts with a consonant, you're going to retain that A between your prefix indicating the number of carbons and your suffix indicating the functional group. All right, so now let's talk about something that you would have talked about all the way back in general chemistry, bond lengths. All right, if I have an example molecule here. And I want to know within this molecule, bond A, B, or C, we want to rank these from shortest to longest. All 
All right, we have a single bond A, a double bond B, and a triple bond C. Which one of these is the shortest of my bonds? The triple bond, right? So triple bonds are stronger and shorter than double bonds, which are stronger and shorter than single bonds. All right, so my shortest is C followed by B, followed by A. And again, the whole logic here is that a triple bond is shorter than a double bond, shorter than a single bond. Okay, cool. So now we're going to take this same molecule and I'm going to ask you the exact same question. Whoops. Okay. But now I want to know A compared to B compared to C. And again, we want to know which one of these is our shortest and which one is our longest. But now we don't have our same simple logic as we applied earlier because we're talking about all single bonds here, right? So how the heck am I supposed to know which one's the shortest single bond, which one's the longest single bond? All right, so this is going to go back to hybridization of these atoms. All right, but first, I just want to take a second and review here our electron geometry of our alkenes and, and actually our alkynes as well. It's really important for the chemistry of these molecules. So I'm going to do a very simple alkene. We're going to look at the Lewis structure of ethene. So first of all, what is the hybridization of the carbon in this molecule here? Either one, they're both the same. So these would be sp2 hybridized, right? So what the heck does that mean? Okay. So first of all, with regard to double bonds and single bonds, you would have learned that single bonds are always classified as what are called sigma bonds. What makes a double bond and a triple bond unique is that they always have one sigma bond, but the other one is a completely different shape. It's what we call a pi bond. All right. The sp2, what the heck does that mean? In this molecule, all of our sigma bonds are formed from those sp2 hybridized orbitals. Right? Carbon has an s orbital and three p orbitals. It mixes two of those p's with its s to make this hybrid orbital. And that's what it's using in bonding. All right? But then what's the pi bond made of? Importantly, the pi bond is made up of that leftover p orbital. Okay. And the geometry of those p orbitals is very different from those sp3 orbitals. So this picture right here is a very helpful picture to have in your head with regard to our electron geometry. Okay. In orange here are our sigma bonds. And sigma bonds are pretty much exactly what you would expect with regard to a covalent bond. 
you have electron density being shared directly between these two carbon atoms, right? So me and this carbon atom are bound together. We're sharing this pair of electrons between the two of us. That's a very simple picture of a covalent bond, the sharing of electrons, okay? The pi bond is very different. It extends both above and below that carbon atom, all right? So here's my p orbital and it's these two p orbitals overlapping to form this pi bond here. All right, so the electron density in that pi bond is sitting above and below that double bond, making it way more accessible and thus way more reactive than a simple sigma bond, than a simple single bond, right? So alkene, or rather alkanes, super boring in terms of reactivity. They basically don't have very many reactions other than you can combust them, right? And then you got to alkenes and it was like, here's this treasure trove of reactions that alkenes undergo. Why are alkenes so much more reactive? Because they have these electrons that are sitting really outside of the molecule, sort of above and below the plane of the molecule. They're very easily accessible, okay? Cool, so uh, again, Purple here is our pi bonds extending above and below the plane of that molecule. All right, so importantly, our alkene here, our geometry, remember for sp2s, these are trigonal planar geometry. And that pi bond sits above and below that plane. So alkenes are flat, and there's a ton of electron density sitting above and below that flat molecule. Okay? So then lastly, our sigma bonds are made up of our hybrid orbitals. If we compare an sp3 to an sp2 to just an sp hybridized orbital, they all have the same sort of basic shape, kind of like this, I don't know, unequal like equilibrium sign here. They have one tiny lobe and one giant lobe. All right, but importantly, the less the fewer p orbitals you add, the smaller these things get. All right, and again, these are what make up our sigma bonds. So that simply means that an sp3 sigma bond is going to be the longest and an sp sigma bond is going to be the shortest and in the middle are those sp2 sigma bonds So then going back to our example that we started out with, everybody take a second and see if you can't rank these from shortest to longest. Okay, so with our bond A here, this is formed by the overlap of two sp3 orbitals. 
right? Both of those carbons are sp3 hybridized. If we look at carbon B, I'm sorry, bond B, it's formed between one carbon that is sp3 hybridized, but the other one is sp2 hybridized. It's part of this double bond here. And if we look all the way over at bond C, it's a sigma bond between this sp3 orbital and this sp orbital. All right, so which one's going to be the shortest, A, B, or C? C, because of that short sp orbital. All right, sp, sp3. B is going to be the next one because it's sp2 and sp3. And A is going to be the longest, which is the overlap between two sp3 hybridized orbitals. All right, so these types of problems, they're going to rely on your ability to classify these atoms in terms of their hybridization, sp3, sp2, or sp, something that we reviewed sort of at the beginning here. All right, and then just keeping in mind the fact that our largest orbitals are those sp3 orbitals, a little bit smaller are those sp2 orbitals, and finally the smallest are those sp orbitals. All right, so now let's bring it back to what we were talking about, our dienes, and we have dis different classifications of our dienes. Okay. A diene is any molecule with two double bonds, but we're going to have different classifications depending on how far apart those double bonds are. All right, so if those double bonds are literally right directly next to one another. So you got the same carbon attached to both of those double bonds. This would be what we call a cumulated double bond. If we have those double bonds located on opposite sides of our molecule, this is what we would call an isolated diene. Okay, and the key to an isolated diene is there is at least one or more sp3 hybridized carbons between those two double bonds. Okay, the last one and what we're gonna see is really the focus of this chapter here are what are called conjugated dienes. Okay, so conjugated dienes here. They always have the same spacing, double bond, single bond, double bond, right? That's this pattern that we're going to spot. Double, then single, then double. Okay. Um, what would be the hybridization of this carbon at the very end here? Sp2. What about this next one? 
also sp2. What about this next one? Also sp2. And what about the next one? Also sp2. All right, so the important feature of these conjugated double bonds is you have these carbon atoms all in a row that all have that same hybridization, that all have that same sp2 hybridization. Okay? These behave very, very differently than other dienes, than other alkenes. Okay? And this goes back to what we were looking at before, which is our electron geometry of these double bonds. All right, I am not an artist, and let's do our best here, okay? Remember that each one of these double bonds is composed of these p orbitals. And it's the overlapping of these p orbitals that gives us our pi bond, that gives us the second of those two bonds. All right? But since I got two of them right next to one another, that means that this carbon also has that p orbital. And this carbon also has that p orbital. All right? And what we're going to see is electrons are going to spread themselves out into all positions here, right? So instead of having one pair of electrons living here and the other pair living here, they're both going to spread themselves out all across that network of conjugated p orbitals, all right? So in our conjugated dienes, These pi electrons will delocalize all right meaning they're going to spread out across both of those double bonds So instead of having one pair of electrons that lives in one pi orbital and another pair of electrons that lives in this other pi orbital, these electrons are going to spread themselves out between these two positions, which I know is a terrible picture, but hopefully you get the idea. They're not staying put. They are delocalizing. They are spreading themselves out between both of these positions. Okay? Uh, we're going to see this phenomenon a lot, and the whole idea here, the whole reason why it's such a big deal, is that when electrons can do that, when they can spread out between multiple positions, you would have talked about this when you were discussing resonance as well, you have that much more stability to your molecule. So conjugated dienes are unusually stable compared to our other type of dienes. All right? In fact, if we're going to rate them here, Conjugated are very stable Isolated are essentially exactly what you would predict these double bonds are not talking to one another They don't see each other in this molecule. They're isolated from one another Cumulated is then the opposite. They are super pissed off to be jammed next to one another right like that. They can't spread themselves out and this geometry is all very rigid. These are very unstable compared to what you would expect. Okay, we'll call this the middle stability. Right? So the focus of this chapter is this idea of conjugation. You get conjugation when you have a bunch of sp2 hybridized carbons all lined up in a row. 
And what happens is that your pi electrons can delocalize to all of these positions across all of those carbons in a row. Cool. All right. So what about the stability of these molecules? Okay, so first of all, in these examples above here, if I asked what was the most stable, what would you tell me? The conjugated, and if I asked you what was the least stable, what would you tell me? The accumulated, okay? So to be clear also, because there's another synonymous term we use with stability, stability is the same thing as saying low energy. Those are literally synonyms with one another. Something that's low energy is good, that's nice and stable. Something that's high energy is bad, that's unstable. Right? So by stability, I mean low energy compound. Okay? All right, so now let's compare two. know which is more stable. All right, so the first thing we got to check is our classification, right? We said cumulated was the highest energy, the least stable. Conjugated, the lowest energy, the most stable. But if I look at these, both of these are what? conjugated. So in that respect, there's a tie, right? So then how do I go from here? Okay, so we have what we call our degree of substitution. more substituted alkenes are more stable. All right, so let's just put down some examples. This is what we would call a mono substituted alkene. What you're going to do is look at each of your sp2 hybridized carbons and count how many carbon neighbors they have. Right? So in this case, I only have one carbon bound to that sp2 hybridized carbon, which is why it's mono substituted. Okay. I'm going to take this double bond and now I'm going to move it to the interior of my molecule here. What's my substitution on this one? Mono, di, tri, tetra. All right, again, we're going to look at our sp2 hybridized carbons and we need to count how many carbons are bound to them. I got one over here and a second one over here, so this would be di-substituted.
All right, what about this one here? We're gonna count our neighbors, right? These are, whoops. These are my two sp2 hybridized carbons, and I need to count. We got one, two, three carbon neighbors. So this would be a tri substituted. And then lastly, the most stable would be your tetra substituted or where all of your sp2 hybridized carbons have carbon carbon bonds all right so let me try to make some room so i can fit these all together Um, to be clear, how did I get the tetra of the four? Because if I look at my carbons here and I count my neighbors, I have one, two, three, four carbon neighbors, right? So tetra substituted. Okay, and again, we kind of ranked these the more substituted, the more stable. So that means my mono substituted is the least stable, and my tetra substituted is the most stable. So, in terms of my alkenes here, my dienes, these are both conjugated dienes. So there's a tie there. All right, but now take a second and try to tell me which one of these is going to be the more stable of the two dienes. Is this a bad example? This was a bad example. Haha, <laughs> I'm gonna put that there. Woo. My bad. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at both of these double bonds and I'm going to rank them as either mono, di, tri, or tetra substituted. <clears throat> All right, this one would be a mono substituted. What about this one in the middle here? This would be di substituted, right? So again, looking at these two sp2 hybridized carbons, I got one, two neighbors. But to be clear, you're only looking at next door neighbors, right? It doesn't matter what happens down the line. All right, what about this one here? This one's mono. What about this one? Now that I fixed it, it's got one, two, three neighbors. So this one's tri substituted. So then which one would be more stable, the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right, the one with the higher degree of substitution. Okay, so in terms of our alkene stability, we got a few different things to consider. I guess we can say diene stability. The first and the most important factor is whether it's cumulated, isolated, or conjugated. If we got a tie there, we break that tie with our degree of substitution. All 
right? And then if all that is equivalent, the last thing that we're going to look at is our stereo chemistry. All right, so let's just take a look at an example here. Okay. In terms of my conjugation, cumulated or isolated, both of these are conjugated double bonds. Right? We got that perfect double bond, single bond, double bond spacing in each of these. They both have the same degree of substitution. The first bond is a mono substituted, and the second bond is a di substituted. The only difference is, is that this is my E stereoisomer, and this one is my Z stereoisomer. Okay? So on your E stereoisomer, you have these two big groups that are on opposite sides of the double bond. On the Z stereoisomer, you have two big groups that are on the same side of the double bond. So which one of these is going to be more stable, E or Z? Yeah, so there's a very simple sterics argument in chemistry, which is that big things do not like to be next to one another, right? So by having this Z conformation, where these two carbons are on the same side of that double bond, is going to be less stable than if we could point them on opposite sides of our double bond. All right, so if all else equal, we're going to look to stereochemistry to bake our tie. And again, the whole logic there is that big groups want to be on opposite sides. Cool. So that's how we would go about ranking our diene stability. We got these three things to consider. First, cumulated, isolated, or conjugated. Then the degree of substitution. And finally, if all that's equal, then we're going to break our tie by looking at the stereochemistry of those uh, double bonds. Cool.